We're so thankful, so thankful to be here. We're so thankful to hear your truth, hear your word. I pray, Lord, that you would do a wonderful work in every single life, in every single heart, and we bless your name for it. Amen. 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 Well, listen, excited to share a, a message simply with you uh, this morning called The Door, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. But really what we're doing is we're continuing a, a, a sermon series that really we preach every single week. There, there's, a, there's a constant theme that we teach, and we, we have different titles for it, and we teach different passages, but we, we teach the greatest story ever told every single week, amen? It, it's the story of, of, of Jesus Christ. It's the story uh, of his life and what he accomplished. We sang about it from our first song, and it flows to everything that we do. It's the life of, of, of Jesus, the greatest story. How does this happen? Well, it happens in this little insignificant town named Nazareth that most historians said wouldn't, it, wouldn't it have even been on a map. When, when Jesus w was born, it was such a small little town to these insignificant parents. Uh, they were just engaged to, to be married, and, and Mary and Joseph and the Holy Spirit shows up in Mary's life and starts this journey. He shows sometime, and at the age of 30, he begins to three years of, of public ministry. And what did his public ministry look like? Teaching, preaching, healing, casting out demons, walking on water, feeding 5,000, feeding 4,000. And the miracles go on and on and on in his life. And it's what we teach and we preach every single week to the point at the end of the three years of public ministry kind of brings us to what we've been celebrating through this weekend. The, the, he's betrayed. He has 12 intimate disciples and one of them, Judas, he betrays him. He, he goes and sells him off for cause. He's at that point, he's arrested. He goes through a series of illegal trials uh, through the, the Roman guard and through the religious leaders and Pharisees of that day to the point where he is bartered off and traded for execution. He's mocked, he's beaten, and he's brutally crucified on a Roman cross. And that's what we celebrated on, on Friday for, for Good Friday. And, and as we continue in his life, he, he, after this, he's placed in a garden tomb. A large stone is rolled in, way with a, w rolled in the way with a Roman uh, symbol on it so that it could not be measured with by Roman guards. And then on the third day, this is what we're here to celebrate today. Jesus arose from death. Life came back into his lungs and filled him to this place. And the followers of Jesus started with some ladies going down to prepare the body for the continual burial. And they go to the tomb and what they find is there's a stone rolled away. Let me just help you with this real quick. That stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out Amen? There was no stone that was going to keep in. It was rolled away so you and I could see in, and we could meet with, with Jesus, and the angel announces to the followers, he is not here, he has risen. Happy Resurrection Day. It's the greatest story ever told. Our calendars and all that we do in our life is marked by this one person named Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, it's across civilization, across countries, across the world, most common calendars are set on the life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, uh, A.D. And, and B.C., before Christ and after death, and, and it marks all of human history. There's never been one person so influential than the person of Jesus, not because he just lived on earth and did things, but because he died and he rose again. And it came to earth. And so you might say, well, that's a great story. We love that story. That's why we're here for Easter. What does that have to do with a door? <laughs> well, let me help you out with that just, just a, a little bit. Well, when Jesus was on earth, this is what he, he never said, I am the cross. He never said, I am the grave. He never said, I am the stone. But what he did say is, I am the door. And, and I like this, this analogy of the door because he, he talks about it. And to me, it's all about access. What, what does a door allow you to do? A, a door allows you to come in or come out. It, 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 it's that place that, that speaks of what kind of access do you have to different places. And uh, I loved growing up. I was, a, I was a pastor's kid. And so that meant that I could go into our church building anytime I wanted even when the people weren't there, and I could take my dad's keys, and I could get into every single door I wanted to get to. And I felt special because I had special access to all of those doors in that building, even when it was closed. And most of the time, I spent time in the gym shooting baskets. That was the greatest access I had. And, and I love this. And there was a, uh, maybe you can think of in your house, maybe there's a certain places or when you grew up. How many of you guys had a place that when you grew up, maybe there were some doors and places you just weren't allowed to go into, right? Mom and dad kept them locked off or maybe places that you worked or grew up in. And that's the way it is. There's this comedian. You maybe have kind of heard this, this joke before, but he kind of talks about 
the doors. And he has this whole story of when he was a kid. And we're about the same age, so I can remember this. Uh, about when he was a kid and someone would come and they would come and they would knock on the door. And the whole house would light up and they would be so excited, right? And they would run to it and they would say, we have company, come on in. Come on in. And the mom would have special, special cakes. Just, just, they weren't allowed to eat them any of the time. But when company came in, they had food ready and they put coffee on and they were so excited. And he tells this story. And I can, I can really reminisce with that. I remember growing up that our, our doors were always open. And I remember being a kid, and maybe you're like me, we would go through the neighborhoods, and I don't think I ever knocked on one door in my life. We just kind of walked into the houses of our friends, and, and you just kind of came in and went out. One of my, one of my best friends, uh, John Egan, and we actually, he wrote that second song we, we, we sang this morning called This Changes Everything, kind of our theme for this whole Easter. And I remember with, with John Dan, we, they never, and if you find out where they live, this might not be a good thing I'm telling you, but their door is never locked, ever. <laughs> They could be on vacation, and you could just go in and stay for a while. It's never, and we never one time did we ever go into the house and, and knock. You just walk in and just kind of announce you're there and start going up the stairs and the hallways and find out who's, who's there that day. And it's the funny thing about it is, even today, we go over there, and we go visit our, our Uncle Jack and Aunt Rose, and we walk in, and the kids aren't there anymore, and we still just walk in. We wouldn't know what it meant to knock the door there. You just go on in and say, hey, who's home? And if no one's home, you go out to the back porch and just kind of wait till everybody gets there. I mean, you guys remember, you have houses or friends like that. Just easy access in and out. Maybe your homes are like that. But the comedian kind of turns the tale of what it looks like today. And when that knock comes on that door or the ring bell comes and he says, everybody get down. <laughs> Who's here? Get, get quiet. What's going on? There's this thing. And so maybe you like that, feel like that a little bit to me. Sometimes we feel like that, to be honest. Um, when our, when our door knocks or doorbell knocks, we have an a, a instant moment of panic that comes over our, our life because uh, our house is messy. And, and I never thought it would be messy. Before we had kids, I, I told you this, Susie had containers for containers for containers. Like, every inside every container was another container with another container inside of that. And it grew, and I would even go and try to help her, like, put things away. And eventually she just said, stop. I'm I, I going to have to go and redo everything anyway. It had to be perfect. And then three boys later, uh, oh, how our world has changed. As much as you can imagine, there are toys everywhere and baseball cards spread across the floors and baseball mitts and footballs and baseballs. And you can just imagine. So when that door knocks, panic comes through us. Oh, no. Who's here? And my boys, this is what they do. They run to the door. And they open it. There's no latch. There's no nothing. They just swing it open. And it, it doesn't matter who it is. They're invited into our house, right? And maybe you can kind of represent a little bit. Well, I love this analogy of the door because as Jesus talks about being the door, it's about access. It's about access to the Father. It's about access to him. It's about access to his kingdom. It's about access to every single thing he has. And so, again, Jesus didn't say, I'm the grave. He didn't say, I'm the cross. He didn't say, I'm the stone. But he says, I am the door. And it's about access to him. And this Easter ceremony is really all about that. So what I want to do is I want to actually look at this passage of scripture that Jesus talks about being the door. And so you can turn to your Bibles to John chapter 10. That's where we're going to be for our remaining time of the, of the service. And we're, and we're going to look at this, and we're going to look at this passage, and it's, it's an incredible thing. I, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. We're going to start at, at John 10. We're going to start right in the first verse, and we're going to focus our times kind of on verses 9 through 10, but to really get the historical narrative of what this means, we've got to paint the picture. And so we're, we're going to start right here, and it says, most assuredly, now this is, this is Jesus speaking, I say to you, I, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold. Now, can I just take a minute and explain? The, let me. I'm gonna have to teach you some some stuff today. Do we do we have any shepherds here today? All right. And, and, okay. I didn't think so. So I'm gonna be good here. I'm gonna teach us a little bit about shepherding and, and what. It, so the, here's what the sheepfold is. The sheepfold is the pen. It's the fold where in a village or in a town there would be multiple shepherds. Actually, lots of them. And, and at night they would all come together and they would gather all of their sheep and they would gather them together and they would go into the same 
sheepfold, and they would bring them into it. And as each shepherd brought their sheep into the sheepfold, they would stand at the door or stand at the gate, and they would use their rod, they would use their, their staff, and as they, they went by, they would grab the collar, you know, the staff has kind of the bow, and they would look at it, and they would look over each and every sheep to make sure that the sheep was okay from whatever happened that day. Make sure it had no diseases, it had no cuts, it had no bumps, had no bruises, whatever happened that day. And it would inspect it. And as it was inspected, after it went through this, he would lift up the rod and he would allow the sheep to come into the sheepfold. Now, why is this significant and why does this matter? Well, you got to understand who Jesus is, and we're going to get to that a little bit. But look at this verse in Ezekiel. It says this. Now, this is the prophet talking about the people of Israel and what would have to happen. It says, I will make you pass under the, the rod, okay? And, and when you do that, I will bring you into into something, into the sheepfold, into the bond of the covenant, into relationship. As you pass through the sheep gate, as you pass through the door, uh, you will go under the rod and I will allow you access into a covenant. And now this is really what Easter is all about. It's about Jesus coming and wanting to make a covenant with you and I. And so he goes under the rod and into the place of covenant. And Jesus begins to tell this story as an analogy, as a metaphor, as a sheep. Let's go back to, to John here. So says, enter the sheepfold by the door. And it says this, okay, does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way. The same is a a thief or a robber. So there's one way to get, proper way to get into the sheepfold, and that is through the door. That is through the gate. That is past the shepherd and going to this place. Anybody who cut, tries to come into the sheepfold opposite of that, climb these stone walls that would have been around it, tries to get through the backside of it, they're a thief and they're a robber. Now, in this parable that Jesus is teaching, there's three kind of main characters, okay? There's the thief. The thief represents who? The devil, okay? It represents those, the enemies. It represents those that are looking to destroy the sheep and have false motives for them. Now, let me give you a little bit more background on this. John chapter 10 is really the teaching of what happens from John chapter 9. So, you know, I tell you guys all this time, the, when the Bible was originally written, there was no chapter and verses. So sometimes these stories, they, they coincide together. So John chapter 9, Jesus comes and he heals a man, it says, who was born blind. And he brings him before the religious leaders, and all of a sudden, he, he's healed, he, he's, he's been set free, and they say, how did this happen? And he kind of says, hey, I, this is all I know. Before I was blind, and now I see. I don't know about all this other stuff. But it, and the religious leaders, they are furious. Why are they furious? Because to do this miracle, Jesus went down to the ground, he gathered dirt, he spit in his hand, and he made a mud patty. And he put it on this man's eyes. But the problem was it was on the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, it's strict religious law. There should be no work done. And so this would have been considered work. And so instead of exalting and being happy for this man who is blind since birth, they are mad at Jesus for working on the Sabbath. And so when it comes to him, who is his audience now he's teaching to? The religious people. The, those Pharisees. Those, the, the, those of the law. And so he begins to say, hey... You might not be on the same team as us, and you might be working again, and the enemy and the devil might be using you to distract people from getting to the true door and the gate. Making sense? Okay, so the same is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the, the door the correct way doesn't come over the gate, doesn't sneak in, doesn't do this. They're not thieves and robbers, but, the, but who enters the door is, here's our second main character, they're the shepherd. They, 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 they're the shepherd. Now, now, who is the shepherd? The shepherd is Jesus, okay? He, he's the one who's caring for, caring for the flock, and he is the shepherd of the sheep. Who's the sheep? We are. Say, bah. bah. We're the sheep, okay? So, so there, there's a thief. This represents the enemy. We have a spiritual enemy. We have someone that's, that, 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 that's, that's out to get us. There's a shepherd. There's one that's looking, taking care of us, and we have us. We're the sheep, okay? Next verses. Verses 3 and 4. To him, him being the shepherd, okay, the doorkeeper. Who's the doorkeeper? So this is the way it works. As the shepherd walks everybody into the sheepfold and they go under the rod, they go in for the night 
And the shepherds, they all go back to their house, and I guess they binge Netflix and eat popcorn. I don't know what they do. But they all go to their homes, and they rest for the night. And then is assigned a doorkeeper who over the night keeps guard over the door or the gate into the fold, into the sheepfold, so no thieves or robbers can come and steal somebody's sheep. Make, make sense? So to him, the shepherd, the doorkeeper, he opens up the doors to the shepherds because now it's morning time. So they put him in. At nighttime, he checks them, makes sure that they're doing okay. Now the shepherd shows up in the next morning, and he says, hey, I'm here to get my sheep. Okay? And so he goes, opens the door, the, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep, they do what? They hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep. So remember, all the shepherds put all their sheep together into the sheep pen, into the fold. And now the shepherd comes, and those sheep... They start hearing the voice of their shepherd. And he says, this is what he does. He calls them by name. Are you with me? So he names his sheep. I mean, what would you name a sheep, you know? Billy Bob, you know? Glass Joe, Bald Bull. Well, those are just Mike Tyson punch out characters. Never mind. But if I, you know, what, what would you call, you know, what would, Spotty? You know, I, I don't know. I think if I had a sheep, I would call him Pasture Pat. That's what I would call him. <laughs> Pastor Pat. That, if I had a sheep, that would be my, that would be the, what I would call him. And so he, he calls to him and says, Pastor Pat. And that sheep hears the voice of his shepherd. And he begins to come out the door. Okay. So he calls him by name and he leads them, his sheep, out. And, and when he brings out his what? His own sheep, not somebody else's sheep. So he goes in and maybe there's a hundred Get the picture here. Maybe in this sheepfold, there's 100, 200 sheep. He has 15 or 20 that are his own. And, and so he, he just calls out his own. He goes before them. So as he calls them out, the shepherd now leads them out the door because the doorkeeper has opened the gate or opened the door and said, these are your sheep. And he takes them with them before them. And the sheep follow him for they know. Say it with me again. They know his voice. Now, I just want to ask you a question. Whose voice are you listening to? Do you know the voice of your shepherd? You know, I think we live in this day that there's a whole lot of voices out there. Do this, go there, believe this, do this, say this. This is the way I want you to behave. This is what I want you to react. This should be what you, what you care about. This is what you should not care about. These are all things. That, there's all these voices out there. And they're going to try to get you to do a whole bunch of stuff. And in the previous verses, he calls those guys thieves and robbers. Because they're out to steal, and they're out to take you away. But, but, but they know his voice, and so they follow behind him. Let's look at verse 5. Yet they, the sheep, say, bah. bah. They, the sheep, will by no means, they will by no means follow a, they're not going to follow a stranger because they don't know the voice of the stranger. And I think part of the problem with the church today is we've allowed some strange voices to get into our house. And we've allowed some voices that don't belong here to begin to try to lead us down paths and open access doors to places that we're not supposed to go. You with me? And so we're going behind doors that should be closed and we're staying outside of doors that have been open to us because we're following strangers' voices. But this is about the sheep who know the voice of their shepherd, and they follow behind them. But they will flee from the stranger. And somehow we're attracted to those other voices. But they flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the stranger. Who are you? What are you trying to say? What are you trying to do? Did you come in through the gate? Did you come over the walls? What's going on? Look at verse 6. Jesus used this illustration. It's a parable. It's, it's a teaching. This is how he did this. And he began to say, hey, I want to explain to you what's happening because I healed this man in chapter 9 on the Sabbath. And you're so mad about your religious rules. And you're so mad that I broke the Sabbath. And what you don't understand is I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the God of the Sabbath. I'm the one who created the Sabbath and I decided to do healing works. And instead of being so happy about a man who was bo born blind, you're so angry that I made a mud patty. So he uses his illustrations 
But they, this is the religious leaders, this is the Pharisees, this is the Sadducees, these are those that want to put their own religious mindsets on us. They believe that redemption is through sacrifice, through, through covenants, through blood covenants. They, they think it, it's their system, they think it's their 600 laws, they think it's all this. And so when Jesus starts to talk about the shepherd and his sheep, it says they did not understand the things in which they spoke to them. They didn't get it. Okay, let's look at verse 7 here. Then Jesus said to them again, because they weren't getting it the first time. They looked at them and they said, no, you're going down for this. Most assuredly, okay, you know, you know what Jesus does? I, I love this. Throughout scriptures, he makes people mad. And then when he's got them mad, he makes them more mad. <laughs> and you know who he makes mad? Religious people. He, he, he didn't make those who didn't know him mad. He didn't make the wounded, the sick those that were demon possessed, he didn't make them mad. He made them religious. That should teach us something. And when he had them stirred up, he stirred them up some more. And now he says, I'm going to double down. I gave you this little analogy first, and I kind of said, hey, listen, there's the shepherd, and he allows the sheep to come in and come out, and he guards them, he does this. But I want to tell you, I'm not just the shepherd. I am the door. And, and I'm, not, I'm not just a door. I'm not just some door. I'm not just any door. You know, this is the world, this is what the world wants to teach us today. Oh, any door will get you there. Oh, just pick a door, just pick some door. Don't worry, we all lead to the same place. No, he says, I am the, say the with me. The. I am the door, and who am I the door? Of the sheep. All whoever came before me, those that you've been learning from, teaching, the, the, these religious leaders, they are they're thieves. And they're robbers, but true sheep who know my voice, they didn't hear them. They didn't hear them. Okay, now we're going to get into our two key verses for this whole. So did I paint the picture? You all feel like shepherds now? Ready to get some sheep? Ready to name some sheep? Okay, verse 9. Here he goes again. I am the door. Now he doesn't even say it. He just, I'm just putting it out there. I am the door. I am the access to what? To heaven, to the Father, to the kingdom. Uh, so he's, I'm, I'm not just, I, I want to make this clear, I'm not just the shepherd, I'm the door. I, I'm the actual little representation of where the sheep come in and out of. I don't just allow them, I am the door that does this. Now, understand, this is a huge thought for us that, that this morning, because there was a time that the door had full access. And we read about it in the book of Genesis. It's the story of Adam and Eve, right? And if you read Adam and Eve, they're in relationship with God the Father. And it says that God came to and fro, from heaven to earth. And they had this intimate relationship. And he came and they, they did life together and they ate together and they spent time together. And there was like this access between Adam and Eve and God. And it was this. And then what happened? Sin. Sin came. And he said, Adam, Eve, where are you? Where, where's that relationship? We had access one to another. And he came and he tells him what happens. He blames it on the woman. You guys know the whole story, right? And, and he says this. And so he says, I am the door. And at that point, God comes and says, out of Eden. You're no longer allowed here. It was this open access to heaven, to God, and to the Father, and to angels. And, and what does he do? He puts an angel as a guard blocking them from going back into Eden. Now, there's a door that's been put in place. And throughout the Old Testament, there's small times that that door kind of gets cracked open every once in a while. We, we see it through the life of Abraham. He gets this vision. Uh, you'll, be, you'll, you'll, you'll be the father of many nations. And we see it through Moses, through the fiery bush. And we see it through Solomon at the temple. And we, we see it during the Day of Atonement where the sacrifice and a high priest goes into that place. And that door is cracked open so that man can meet with God. And there's this, there's this moment. And there's these things that happen. And we see it with Mary when she's conceived with Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes on her and, and, and begins to happen and this door cracks open and now Jesus says now I am the door and this is what we're celebrating today Easter was about unlocking and opening the door Amen. to you and I Amen. come and have access to God come and have access to the Father come and have access to the Holy Spirit come and have this and if anyone enters by me which is the door he will be what? He'll be saved. 
He, he'll, he'll be saved. And he will go in and out and he will find pasture. Awesome, right? Now here's the verse that we probably all know. And now I've laid a little context for you. Verse 10. The thief does not come, I should have highlighted this word, except. He only has one thing he wants to do. Except to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy has one plan over your life. You with me? Steal, kill, destroy. Steal, kill, destroy. I'm going to kill your marriage. I'm going to steal your children. I'm going to kill your business. I'm taking you. The enemy wants to take you out, and he will use any means possible. And in this case, he was using these religious leaders to lead people astray. Right? That's, that's the real context of the story. And the thief, the enemy, the devil, he's going to use whatever he can. And when he gets a hold of you, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, the shepherd, the door, Jesus, I have come that they may have what? Life. life. And not only they may have life, they will have it more abundantly. Or some versions say they will have it to the full. How many are ready for the fullness of God to fall in your life? How many are ready to have access to the door of freedom? The access to the door of what God wants to do in your life. And so I love verses 9 and 10. I'm going to quickly give you, give you, give you four things that I, that I want you to, to jot down here. Because Jesus is the door. And the first thing is Jesus is the door of access. Jesus is the door of access. Verse 9 eight. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. I'm not a door. I'm not some door. I'm not just random door. I am the door. Look at this verse in, this verse in Acts. Acts 4.12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, which we must be saved. It's all about Jesus. Don't get confused. Don't get lost out there. Jesus is the way. I am the one way to get to the Father. Amen? Amen. He didn't come to make it more complicated. He came to make it simple. How do I get to heaven? The name of Jesus. Look at the second thing here. Jesus is the door of provision. Second part of verse 9. And we'll go in and out of the sheepfold. And the shepherd will come, and the door will access to you, and you will find pasture. What's pasture? It's nourishment. It's food. It's health. It's everything. It's exercise. It's everything that we need. As the shepherd comes in and takes us out, you will go. How many of you say, I need, something for, I need some provision in my life? I need God to show up in some areas. Well, Jesus is the door to provision. He's the place who comes and brings you out to pasture so you can be nourished, so you can be full, so you can grow in God. Look at, look at this verse in Philippians, right? Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply what? All. all. Not some, not a little bit, not every once in a while. All of your needs according to his riches. Not, not, not my riches, not this world's riches, not my neighbor's riches, not the lottery's riches, right? According to his riches in glory by who? Again, one name, one door, Christ Jesus. Look at number three. Jesus is the door of protection. Verse 10, the thief, he does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. So Jesus is the door to protection. So this is the cool thing about a door. The door lets some people in, and it keeps some people out. You with me? And so when we have Jesus at the door of our life, he says, come in. Have life with me. Move with me. But when that enemy comes, he goes, we close the door. And God has his protective hand on your life. Look at, look at verse 11 in John. John 10, 11. Okay, so this is the verse after John, John 10, 10. I am the what shepherd? I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd, this is what he does for protection's sake. How many say, I need to be protected by the good shepherd? He gives his life for his sheep. How did Jesus protect you? He died for you. He took the cross for your sin and for your shame and everything you had. He is the good shepherd. Shepherd. The fourth one is this. Jesus is the door of life. I am the door, and I am the door of life. I have come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. How many of you are ready to start living an abundant, full life in God? Amen. Amen. This is what it's about. Abundant, full life with God. Look at this verse in the book of Acts. We know this one. Acts 17, 28. For in him we what? We live, we live and move 
and have our being. Everything that we are is found in Jesus. I am the door of life. Now, this word life in the Greek, it's the word zoe. It means spirit-filled life. It means abundant life. It means a life that's full. It means that your life is not just about breathing in and breathing out. It's not about existence. It's not about just getting through another day. I have come that you might have spirit-empowered, spirit-filled, moving life with destiny and a purpose. For in him we live and move and have our being. Jesus is the door to life. Amen? Let me give you one last analogy, and then we're going we're gonna to move on. This is... I think one of the biggest problems. Sometimes in life, we just think, we just think there's so many, there's so many doors. How do I pick? What do I do? They put that picture of the game show up there. You guys remember this? How many of you guys know, let's make a deal? Uh, you go to this place, you dress up crazy, you're all out, you're all out of sorts, and, and, and you do this. And how many of you guys remember the old school, let's make a deal, right? If you're old, raise your hand. I remember the old one. This is the new <laughs> And so they come up and they bring a contestant and say, here's something I want to give to you. But you have the choice if you want. You can trade what I've already given to you, and you can pick door one, door two, or door three. And people are like, I don't know what door to pick. You know, I don't know. And behind some doors is like $50,000, and some is like a donkey. You know, It's like it's, it, it's rough or a goat or something like that. right? And so they don't know. And I think this is where so many people live their life. I don't know. I don't know what door to go through. I don't know what to do. And she says, I am the door. You don't, need to, you, don't need to pick, you don't need to pick out of 20 doors. And you say, but Pastor John, how do I know which door is him? Look at this verse in Revelation. This is amazing. This is Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and I. Come on now. Come on. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anybody hears what? My voice. Because the sheep, we know the voice of our shepherd. And he says, listen, I'm not going to make this hard for you. What door? You're going to hear me knocking. And you're going to hear my voice. And when you do that, you're going to be like my little kids. And you're going to run to the door. And you're going to open it up. And you're going to say, come on in. And he says, and when you open the door, I will come in to him. And this is what he'll do. He'll dine with him. And he, What does that mean? I will come in and we will do life together. We will experience the goods, the bads, the highs, the lows, the mountains, the valleys, the peaks, the whole thing. I will come in and we will do life together because I am the door. Amen? Let's all stand together.